Woman on screen is named Patty Height. She goes around to small churches convincing people that, like, their kids are turning trans because of cartoons and manga. I'm not joking. I'm 100% real with that. Anyway, uh, I wanted to listen to this church appearance that she made. This isn't part one. If you didn't see other, don't sweat it. This stands independently of the rest. I'll give context if it's missing. Just listen to what she has to say in this, and you'll get what I'm talking about here. I would also add, go down one more to the manga and anime. Sorry, manga. Manga. And find out the dangers in that. Really dangerous. It looks like just cartoons. It's not. It's not. It's demonic. It's from the pit of hell. Um, every show basically has some type of demonic character in it, even Pokemon. Even Pokemon. And you get the idea. The point is that she thinks that manga and Pokemon cause people to be trans. So I want to listen to the whole thing. This is not part one. If you didn't see the other, don't sweat it. This stands independently of the rest. I'll give context if it's missing. Let's listen to the second part of the QA, where they're just talking about manga and Pokemon. To point them to God. Have you thought about asking God about this relationship? Get them thinking about getting his opinion about it. He wants to tell them. He doesn't want them to live in this deception. He wants them to know the truth. Invite them to know the truth. In right, right. Up to now, people have been asking, like, what do I do if I have a gay family member? And they're just, like, talking about being gay. Not, like, making out around me or whatever. Just talking about the fact that they're gay. That's it. Is it wrong? Am I validating their gay lifestyle choice if I give them relationship advice? And the answer in these people's minds is yes, yes. You are validating, I'm sorry, you are validating their gay lifestyle choice. Invite them to open scripture. Let's see what God says about this. What does God say a healthy relationship is? Point to a husband-wife relationship described in the Bible. And also one more thing, always offer prayer. I always offer prayer. Uh, Love her hair. I've been talking about this the entire time. Her hair is fantastic. Offer prayer. Can I pray for you? And honestly, a lot of people, even people that don't believe in God, they want to be prayed for. And they will. No, no, they don't. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I can tell you unequivocally and beyond a shadow of a doubt, I don't want to be prayed for. I don't have a problem with being prayed for. Feel free if you think that's going to fix my problems, but it's not. Additionally, I appreciate that you pray for me. That's nice of you. It means you're thinking of me and you're hoping the best or whatever. That's cool. I like that. But honestly, I guess it's more like I couldn't possibly care less if you prayed for me. We'll say yes, please pray for me, and then you can pray over that person. They probably just don't want to make you feel awkward by saying f*** off. Right then and there. I don't offer. I just start praying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, Taking away people's freedoms, their uh, right to make choices for themselves. That sounds right. Like it or not, are you getting <laughs> prayer? Yeah, you know, and let me just say, and, and, and I don't think uh, anybody's touched on this yet. Whoever that is that asked the question, I commend you that you have a relationship with your lesbian cousin that she trusts you to talk about these things. I mean, that, that speaks highly of the leverage you've got in their life, the influence yeah. that you've got in their life. Now use that influence for God's glory. Well, it's possible, nay likely. I've been in this exact situation. I'm not gay, but I'm not religious. Um, my mom has made religion part of her personality inextricably. And in my case with my mom, I'm around her on occasion, not anymore. I haven't been around her in years now, but on the rare occasion, I find myself in her company. And when I'm around her, she can't help but to talk about Jesus constantly and Jehovah's Witnesses. There's like no other subject knocking around in her head, it seems. That doesn't mean she has influence in my life. She doesn't at all, like zero. So effectively, what these people are going to accomplish is burning their relationships even further to the ground. You know, because if that influence only exists as long as you live in a lie or compromise, then that's not real influence. That's just condoning sin. You know, but if that influence exists because they know you love them unconditionally, then that's an influence you should be using for God's glory. Yeah, but you don't love them unconditionally. That's the problem here. That's what I'm complaining about. That's an influence you should be using to draw them to Christ, because ultimately, if you love them, you don't want to see them perish. And you're not going to condone their sin. You're not going to be around that. That's a condition on love. Are you serious right now? 
you want them to come to Christ. And so it's an opportunity for you to share. But it's just, uh, you need that Solomonic wisdom. And this is, we live in a day where you've got to be able to navigate these relationships with Solomonic wisdom. Uh Look, I'm sorry, I have to address this, this Solomonic wisdom thing. King Solomon was not wise. He was not wise. He was dumb as dog shit, okay? He tried to cut a baby in half as a solution to a problem. That is not wise. That's stupid. He lucked into the realization that, oh, maybe that person's the mom. Hell, maybe a courtier told him that. I don't know. But that was a really fucking stupid thing to do. You know why, if no other reason? You can't just say, I'm going to do this thing and then not follow through. If you're going to do something, you have to be ready to pull that trigger or cut the baby, if you will. As somebody who grew up watching his dad, King David, slaughter people en masse, I don't believe for a second that he wasn't prepared to cut that baby in half. I'm sure he was. He was a, he was a colossal scumbag, King Solomon was. And what's more, he was really, really stupid. He was handed a kingdom fully intact by King David, and it took almost no time at all for it to crumble to pieces. It fell apart because he's so unwise. He is so stupid, so bad at running kingdoms. All this is assuming that the biblical narrative is to be trusted, and I don't know if it is, but whatever. Uh, we're dealing with uh, a, a, a devil who has cunningly fed them all of the lines that you're going to say and told them that if you say this, it's because you hate them. If you say this, it's because you're, you're, you're racist. It's because like they, you're racist. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to say that, that sounds racist, but really isn't, I wonder. The problem is that there's no, uh, th these people don't seem to connect with the fact that they really are ruining people's lives, that they really are effectively showing conditional love. He didn't even realize that much. You're a bigot. It's because you're this or that. A homophobe, right? Yeah, transphobe. And, and, and all those thoughts, yes. thoughts have been planted in them. And so somehow you've got to pray and say, Lord, I need the right things to say and the right heart to say it with and the right timing to say it in. Absolutely. Absolutely. This one's similar. And it's actually a question that became kind of a scandal in the church recently. This is really sad, man. I'm, I'm so sorry that these people fell into this so deeply. They cannot find their way out. Will they ever realize that they are like doing real lasting damage to the people around them? Are they ever going to connect with that? I believe everybody on stage is either LGBT or has an LGBT family member. I think the one on the far right is a lesbian. And the other th three might have trans kids. The one in the red definitely has a trans kid. She's talking about it earlier. Anyway, um, it's so heartbreakingly sad to listen to these people just convince themselves more and more every day that they're doing the right thing when they are burning their relationships to the ground actively. That is some shit, seriously. My brother is engaged to his boyfriend. What should I say when they start to make plans and eventually invite me to their wedding? Like, Ooh, you can't go to a gay wedding. Like I said, this is a scandal in the church recently because Alistair Begg responded to somebody asking a similar question, and apparently the church doesn't agree with Alistair Begg's answer. for the I don't know who Alistair Begg is, but I'm sure the church probably does. The most part, and so we'll talk a little bit about that, but let's go ahead and bring it over here. One of you ladies want to take that on? You want to take that on? Go for it. I will. Um, again, we go back to scripture. What does the Bible say marriage is? And who is it for? And who put the boundaries of it in place? Whose design is it? We go to that. There is a gracious way to love on your loved one who is planning to get, quote, married to their... Quote, married. It's not real married. Quote, married. Okay. LGBT partner. And it's with honesty and to let them know, I love you. And because of my firm biblical foundational belief, that is not just what I think, but who I am, 
I can't go to that celebration. And there's a bunch of scripture that talks about what the celebration actually is. It's not just going to a party. When you're going to a wedding, you're going as a witness. You're going in. No, no, you're not going as a witness. There are witnesses present for that. Uh, when I got married, there had to be witnesses present for that, actually. Yeah, you do have to have witnesses. You're witnessing an event, but you are not the witness that's like necessary for a wedding. I don't know why they even require witnesses. Like, can't a judge just sign off on it and that's good enough? It's just really, I don't know, it's a weird system to me, whatever. In affirmation and support of that couple having a successful union, which means that if you go to a, a same-sex, quote, marriage or trans marriage or what my daughter has, a trans queer marriage, quote. That's f***ing sad, man. She will never be able to accept the fact, seemingly, that she is applying conditional love to her family. And she's like, she's ruining people's lives in the process. She won't ever be able to just let people be who they are. Really sad shit. You are telling them, I'm going to support you in your perpetual sin. Is that loving? It's really not. So a better approach can be an offer. I'd love to have you guys over for dinner and have a conversation with you. But once I get you at the table, I'm going to chew out for being with a, a guy, gal, or non-binary pal. I just, I cannot celebrate that because in the eyes of God, it is not marriage. And I can't, I can't support what he says is not marriage. And I don't want to support you in, in a union that he doesn't deem is marriage. And I love you. Please don't say but. Okay, that just. And I love you. Interesting. Uh, but I love you. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction that she made there. Okay, I can appreciate that, actually. And I love you. But you're not showing that you love the person when you're acting like this. So I'm sorry, just like I reject it. I don't accept what you're saying here. Just negated everything before. And I love you. And I'm here for you. And I want to stay in relationship with you. And I'd love... And if you don't do what I tell you, then we aren't going to stay in relationship. That's effectively the same as but. It's but with multiple steps. I'd love to talk about, you, about this more with you and go in the scripture and show you what it says if you're up for it. Give them the invitation. They can And if they're not up for it? And say no. Invitation, not obligation. They're not obligated to like your opinion, and you're not obligated to get them to like it either. It's none of your business, really, what... Boom! I love it! Absolutely! That's fantastic. Somebody is connecting with logic here. That's awesome. No, it isn't any of your f***ing business, actually. That's fantastic. First smart thing today that I've heard on this panel. They think about your, your position biblically. That's between you and God. What you get to do is, is walk that out in a way that's loving and gracious and telling them, I love you and... I love you and God loves you and there's more for you and he wants more for you. That's the way we do it. Yes. The, the great thing about all this is we have such a wonderful program here the way through and you can learn those tools to help you get through those hard questions like these. Um, it's really helped me um, going through my fourth time this next season and I'll be a facilitator in training. Um, but it really helped me with a lot of different things that I go through with my... You know, I'll take this step. I will say it's hard to get used to a kid forming out their own identity. If you find out your kid is trans and it was totally unexpected, that can be hard for everybody. Whether you believe, uh, whether you accept who they are, whether you accept the fact that people are trans, it is irrelevant. It's hard to get used to, period. Instead of putting their time and energy into figuring this whole thing out and talking to people and reading scientific studies and learning about their kid and asking, asking their kid questions and all of that, they have put every ounce of their energy, pretty obviously, I'm comfortable saying that, into fighting it. The woman on screen just said that she went to like four different, what was it, four different annual um, like educational something or other at churches? That's some shit, man. 
and their eyes would get huge and they said, yes, they're very into anime 100% of the time. That's my, my experience, not me digging into studies. I don't really know how to do studies. Or Knock me over with the feather. You don't know how to do studies, you say? Read studies that well. That's just my own experience. And that was before I found that other people were talking about that as well. Wow. So the point is that they, these women, have no idea what's happening. They have no clue what's going on. And they've poured every ounce of their energy into fighting it instead of learning about it. It's sad. To boys. But I, all these questions are um, in the tools and the gems that help us like, just navigate these really tough questions that we have and we don't want to hurt their feelings but like miss you ever consider asking them did you think that might be a, a good first step she's saying that she's running some stupid church service for training or whatever instead of simply asking the person genius i'm sorry patty <laughs> patty said um you know if you don't tell them the truth in love you know it's, it could be deadly for them. It could be something that is going to keep them from Christ and that you're that example. You're that example in their life. Like uh, Pastor Jimmy said, you're the influence in their life. I have one son that I talk to, one son that I don't talk to. And so I do have an influence in the one I get to talk to. I you can hear her voice breaking up. She cares about this. Honestly, she does. She cares. And she doesn't know how to handle it aside from removing the person from her life or at the very least being willing to go so far in harassing the person that she's willing to cut them out of her life that is sad i don't affirm his sin but i love him and accept him and that I, i'm assuming that the her kid or both of her kids are probably both trans i'm assuming right i Probably not a safe assumption, so I'm just going to try to use they as the pronouns, but yeah. That's why we are open. Our communication is open, and there's different things that come from that, different blessings. But, you know, recently he asked me to send him a Bible. Mm. God. Wow. That's awesome. Amen. Wow. Big deal. That's awesome. Send him a Bible. That's really sad, man. This kid is falling for it. And that's an important distinction. Um, acceptance and affirmation they're two different things you look them up in the dictionary they're two entirely different things i jesus accepts us where we are but he doesn't affirm us where we are right um okay sure i suppose yeah acceptance and affirmation are different but you can just accept who somebody is and leave them be let them live their own life it's not your responsibility to force your beliefs down everybody's throat constantly same with our identifying loved ones. We can love them where they are and stand firm that that's not who God created them to be and continue to pray into that. And Monica's right. We, we have at the end of our, our, our guide, our survival guide, I call it, uh, what we call trip hazards, because these are questions, they're very common questions. And so I put three of them in there that I really unpack in great detail why it trips us up, what scripture says about it, and I give some suggestions what, how you can respond in a biblical way and ask you to pray about it and seek the Holy Spirit. This is the number one. Her trip guide? Interesting. One question I get in a Q&A when it's not youth group, and so let me just pipe in on it real quick. Um, and so years and years ago, um, this one young... But did somebody ask the question? ...lady who uh, called me uh, uh, like a mom to her. Um, she, she got married. It was preparing to get married to another woman. And so I, um, she knew I was probably going to say no, but I'm like, well, let me pray. And so I just like, Lord, you know, do you want me to go? And it was quickly a no. And, but he gave me a word. He said, if you go, you'll be deceiving her. And so I told her, mm -hmm. I'm like, look, um, I can't go. And, you know, I said a couple other things, but quickly I just said, the Lord told me I, I'd be deceiving you. If I go, she's like, no, no, no. I know where you stand. I, I know, you know, the ministry you have. It was the beginning days of my ministry. I know you're, I, I know where you stand. Trust me, you're not going to be deceiving me. And I'm like, look, God said I'd be deceiving you. I don't know. I don't know what that means. What's she talking about? Is she saying that, like, I do, I, I'm just unclear. What the hell is she talking about? Maybe I missed something. So whether I go 
or I don't go, it's going to affect our relationship. If I go to the to your wedding, it's going to affect our relationship because I'm being disobedient to God. Okay, I understand. And he's not going to allow this relationship to be what you and I are hoping it to be out of my disobedience. That's my sin. So that's going to affect our relationship. If I don't go, it's going to affect our relationship because you're going to be very hurt and very, very mad at me. But I believe through my obedience, God will do a mighty work and you'll come back and you'll still want to be a part of my life. Because Okay, wow. And if you're wrong, you're seeing what hap what's happening here, right? My mom does the same thing. They put it on you. It's your fault that you're doing this. It's not them who has conditional love. It's you who has conditional love. If you choose not to live the way I want you to live, then I won't be a part of your life. You're making that decision. This is such an underhanded, dirty framing. You can let me make my own decisions and live my own life and also be a part of my life. You know what? You don't even have to be a, you don't have to be that part. You don't have to be involved in my relationship in any way if you don't want to but you can still be a part of my life. Yeah, you know, my mom went to my, um, well, like my adopted grandma's house, like my kid's great grandmother, went to her house to talk to her and convince her that I was the one that ended the relationship and that I was preventing a relationship from happening. And my grandmother saw straight through it, of course, but she was trying to convince her that she would take me back any moment that I wanted. I just had to make the decision to be in her life. And what did that decision entail? Going back to meetings for a minimum of like a year, writing multiple letters to the elders, doing all of my literature, you know, reading through and studying it or whatever every week, being shunned in person for a full year straight, probably. At least six months usually closer to a year or even a year and a half. So anyway, uh, that's what would be involved in being a part of my mom's life again. That's not an option for me, okay? First of all, I don't believe it. And if I don't believe it, I, I shouldn't be a part of it, right? And second, she's the one putting a halt to all of this, not me. Because God's gonna honor my obedience. You know, she used to do this shit to me. I'm sorry, she used to do this to me all the time. She used to say, I'm not the one stopping the relationship. And I, and I would say, oh, great, fantastic. Okay, then call me tomorrow and we'll talk. And she says, you know, that's not how it works. No, I didn't know that's not how it works. This is news to me. I thought you said that you were going to be in my life. You're going to be part of, you know, my goings on. What happened? What happened is she can't lie anymore about it. It's a lie and she knows it's a lie and I know it's a lie and I call her on it. And everyone else thinks that it's real what she's saying. But I know it's not, and she knows it's not. She can lie to anybody except for me. But if I'm disobedient, disobedient I'm in sin, and I might end up your, at your wedding, but it's going to... Dude, I'm not even doing the thing that got me disfellowshipped anymore is what kind of blows my mind. Like, it was smoking... Well, you know what? I've been smoking cigarettes lately, so I guess I am, kind of. Um, but there was a long stretch of time. I don't smoke very often. It's pretty rare now. There's a long stretch of time where I wasn't smoking cigarettes at all. Uh, years and years and years, right? You know, don't drink alcohol, don't do any illicit substances, don't nothing. And through that entire stretch, she knew me that whole time and still chose not to be a part of my life, despite the fact that I wasn't doing things that she didn't like anymore. Honestly, I, I used to swear all the time when I was part of the religion. I'm not giving that shit up. No matter, no one is gonna pry the f word from my cold dead lips. I ruin our relationship every day after that. Yep. Wow, that's a great answer. Great answer. We got time for one last one. And Jesus. Oh, sorry. Was yeah. that premature? That's the answer. Okay. That's the answer. <laughs> but it's not. That's the thing. It's not. Answer. <laughs> I didn't even ask the question yet. You already got it right. <laughs> That was the joke. <laughs> get it, Patty Karnak. <laughs> Did he just get it? I think he just got it. That's good. I like that sort of thrival guide. I never heard of that before. I'm, I'm going to use that. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to steal that. I'm figure out where to steal it, but that's good. 
Theft is a sin, good sir. The Bible's a survival guide, isn't it? Yeah. No, it isn't. Oh, awesome. So the church is wrestling with this explosion of sexual identity and homosexuality that's happening in this generation. It is, uh, it's, we're losing this culture right before our eyes. And Losing the culture. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know what? The culture of older people is kind of fading away in favor of younger people. That's how things have worked since the dawn of time. You're just experiencing it for this uh, for the first time, as we all will eventually, probably, hopefully. You just can't give up on the fact that people are different from you. And uh, and some of the doctrine that's being accepted in the church, even in some Calvary chapels, is nothing short of heretical and destructive. And so I, I wanted to take a few minutes to address this issue uh, because I think you're going to hear this from other churches and somehow think that it's an okay answer, and it's not. It's actually very destructive. So I wonder okay. if we could spend a couple minutes, our last couple minutes, talking about side B theology. And uh, Patty, would you explain side uh, what is it? Psi B theology? Minutes, our last couple minutes talking about Psi B theology. And yes, it's Psi B theology. What the f? Uh, Patty, would you explain side A and side B theology? And let's talk about. Oh, side B, like side A and side B. Okay, that's not what I thought he was saying. All right, go on. About that for a second. You even have notes on this one. Yeah, it's um the well you can't see it. There's a handout on the table wherever the table is, and it's also on my website uh, because it was becoming so prevalent. Um, gay identifying Christians that it it has to be talked about now. I, I prefer gicks. Obviously, it's gay people that are are bringing forth that identif identifier. Um, I'm gay and I'm a Christian, but they quickly saw that even within that umbrella term of, of gay Christian, there was gay Christians that still were actively involved in, in relationships. Oh, I see. You can't be involved in relationships. All right. Let me lay this out for you. I, I wanted to avoid this, but sometimes this comes up. You have to talk about it. There's a guy named Bart Ehrman, who is a New Testament scholar, knows what he is talking about. Very knowledgeable on the subject. Been involved in it for like 30 years, 20 to 40, I think, on the higher end of that. And he broke this down. He's broken this down a number of times, if you want to read about it. His friend, Jeffrey Sykes, they went through college together, their PhD programs. And he had Jeffrey Sykes on his channel to talk about his YouTube channel. Uh, they've both written books, I believe, on these subjects. But here's the bottom line. The Bible was not... Uh, really critical of long-term gay relationships. Certainly not the way that we understand them today. It just wasn't. It mentions it in any form a total of six times. Those six times that it's mentioned don't really, they don't really apply the way that people tend to think they do. Three in the Old Testament, three in the New Testament. The first one in the Old Testament is in Genesis about Sodom and Gomorrah, but that wasn't about being gay. That was about ill treatment of the poor. Had nothing to do with being gay. When they got there, there were people trying to take advantage of them. And so I, I guess that, you know, gay is kind of in the equation to some degree, but it was more about their poor treatment of guests. They were just total scumbags is, is the point. Like they treated people like shit, um, the poor and guests and everybody else. They were all treated like shit. So that one's right out the window. The next two are Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. But those two are Old Testament, and what's more, they are old law. They're Mosaic law. That was nullified. And aside from that, it wasn't even talking about gay marriage in the old law. You know, I know that because rabbis have been talking about this for like a really long time to understand exactly what the law was talking about. Rabbis, as kind of a community, have come to the determination that gay marriage was not enforced, like uh, punishment against gay marriage was not enforced. They came to the conclusion that being gay was technically in the law, but nobody paid any attention to it. And as a result, they excluded it from future laws like the uh, Babylonian and the Jerusalem Talmud, I think is what they are. Those are like a kind of a clinical um, 
God, what's the word I'm looking for here? A clinical academic breakdown of Jewish law and culture from thousands of years ago. So Jews technically had those things in their books, I suppose, but they don't belong there, really. And everybody knows that. The next three are in, I believe, 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, and Romans one twenty-seven. I, I think. 1 Timothy and 1 Corinthians are basically the same. Um, it's not really talking about being gay. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, and 1 Timothy 1, 9 to 10. Do you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is 1 Corinthians. Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, and the greedy, uh, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what Jeffrey Sykes, dude on the left, says. This passage is a vice list that Paul employs to condemn what he sees as unethical behavior. It's a fairly generic list, but it includes two terms, male prostitutes and sodomites. That debate involved translations of two Greek words, malakoi and arsenikoitai. The first, malakoi, literally means soft ones, while the second term, arsenikoitai, literally means male betters. Arsenikoitai is a hapax legomena, I think. It's a word that only ever appears in literature once, and we have no other context for when it should be used. What mattered in first century same-sex acts between men was... Wait, between men was who was in the active position and who was in the passive position. Thus, the translation difficulties for modern translators. While male prostitutes is arguably a good translation for malakoi, sodomite is arguably a poor translation for arsenikoitai, as it involves the history and use of the word and its connection to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In my view, a better, if colloquial, translation of the two related terms would be something like male prostitutes, and the men who hire their services. Interesting. There you go. And uh, 1 Timothy 1, 9-10 is basically the same thing. It's broken down similarly. The other one is Romans one twenty seven. That one is kind of a dead-to-rights scripture, if you will. Uh, it, it seems more dead-to-rights, at the very least, than the others. Here's his breakdown of Romans uh, one twenty six to 27 it says, for this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women who were consumed by passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now, here's what Jeffrey Sykes says about it. This is typically seen as the most significant Bible passage that deals with, the same, with same-sex relations. Yeah, it is. It's like nearly the only one. It includes both women and men. The larger context indicates that idolatry leads to a distortion of natural relationships. That Paul condemns what he knows of same-sex relations is clear, but this raises the question of what Paul understood in his context. Most scholars agree that Paul would have been aware of three same-sex practices found in pagan culture. Pagan meant non-Jewish and non-Christian, basically, at the time. Uh, if you could even say Christianity was a religion yet. So they, he was condemning these three practices in pagan culture. Pederasty, an older man with a prepubescent boy. Prostitution, where a man sells himself to be the passive participant in a same-sex act. And slave prostitution, where a slave owner rents out his slaves for sexual acts. There's no evidence that Paul is aware of committed, consensual, same-sex relations between adults, that is presumed, I'm sorry, uh, between adults, that is presumed in same-sex marriage today. The bottom line here is that what we know as, like, gay marriage didn't exist in the Bible. Like, nothing like it existed in any way. People were sleeping with each other, but, you know, honestly, marriage didn't exist at the time, actually, really. In Jesus' day, marriage did not exist, certainly not as we understand it. So, the point is that these people have a modern conception of something and find a reason to be angry about it. That's it. That's what it's all about. The Bible does not actually condemn gay marriage. It doesn't. It just doesn't. Christians who were no longer involved in relationships but still carry the identity, so they had to make subsections of it. So the main, two main parts of gay Christianity are side A and side B. And so side A gay Christians believe uh, that God not only says it's okay to have same-sex relationships, 
but he blesses it with extra blessing because they're they're a sexual minority and jesus is all about social justice and you know jesus was a se well yes sexual minority because he never got married i mean it's yes 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 to all of that you're correct it's so crazy and no it's it's accurate what do you mean crazy and so um they don't believe the bible to be true they believe the word homosexual was misinterpreted and it was Hey, Pax Legomenon. Okay, we don't know what it meant. We know that it was a combination of two words. The words were man and bed. That is not gay. There was a word for gay at the time, okay? Why did they use a word that was non-existent in, the, in culture at the time instead of just using the word for gay? Why? And on and on it goes. So that's under side A of this handout that you'll see. Now, side B believes in the Bible... Uh, in the sense of what the Bible says about sexuality, that marriage is be to, be to, to be between one man and one woman. But it isn't. Marriage didn't exist. Woman in a heterosexual monogamous relationship for life. However, and so they think having sex, heter uh, homosexual sex is sinful. They don't believe the identity is sinful. They believe that you can be a celibate gay Christian, because uh, God created you. He gave you a same-sex orientation. Uh, that's what it is. I don't care how much you scream it. You're going to be gay, okay? That word orientation is very dangerous, but it's a common word that we— there is no such thing as a heterosexual and a homosexual orientation. It's Right, it's a lifestyle choice, right? It's a new cultural concept, and it's a lie. Mm -hmm. There's no such word as gender in the Bible. It's always been sex. But Dr. John Money, back— Okay. It hasn't always been sex. It's a, I don't know what word was used in the Bible, specifically— our word was sex. At best, you know it wasn't written in English, right? And that human beings translated it and put the words in where they belonged, right? And that it's not like a one-to-one -one translation? Like in the 1950s is the one that came up with gender identity, and he's a He's a disgusting man that did sexual experiments on children. Yeah, I don't know what she's talking about, but I'm sorry, I just don't believe anything out of her mouth. He's the one that came up with the term gender, and now we speak it. And so, anyways, that just that that ugh, that boils my blood. But but so uh, the side B gay Christians believe God created them that way, but then says no, no, no. <laughs> like Pastor Jimmy was saying, you know, sexuality is such a core of of who we are. It's what God has given us, not only to create new life, but it's to be pleasurable as well. And we've distorted that new life, but it's to be pleasurable as well. And we've distorted that on, on this handout. When you, when you look at it, just go line, line by line down it to compare what it is and it will speak for itself. But, um, like the final uh, word is that I have on here is these these two categories describe two prevalent identities within the gay Christian community. The church, both progressive and even some conservative, are now embracing these false self-proclaimed identities as well. We must remember that our identity is in Christ, in Christ alone. And so when we come to Jesus. So you're not gay or straight, you're Jesus. He crucifies everything in us that sin the things that we uh, feel and desire and the behavior that comes from those desires. It's not just the behavior that needs to be crucified. It's the desire as well. Let me. Yeah, but the desire cannot be eliminated 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. This thought process leads to gay conversion camps. Just be clear about something before we close, because we... We're dealing with an issue with side B theology, this idea that you, you can be gay and be Christian as long as you're not practicing your homosexuality. You can still be gay because, hey, God created some to be eunuchs for life. And so you can just. Yeah, that's accurate. That's absolutely true. That's gender nonconforming is the word you're looking for for that. Just abstain and not touch anybody, and, and, and you're okay with God, that he's pleased with that. This idea, because they use Scripture for their argument, is sweeping the church. It, there are some Calvary chapels that are embracing it.
And what's your argument against that? What's your argument that people shouldn't allow themselves to just like be gay, but not like be in a relationship or whatever? I mean, all of it is nonsense, but I can't like figure out what logic they're using here. I, I read recently, I don't know any details about this, but that this is one of the big fights in the Southern Baptist Convention right now, whether this is acceptable or not. I don't know any details on it. I just recently read that it was a major issue in the Southern Baptist Convention. So it's very likely that this is something that you'll see a lot of pastors that you maybe even once respected teaching from their pulpits. And so I need to encourage you to be Bereans. Take this stuff to the Word of God and, and really look at the Scriptures. You see, it's impossible to say, I'm gay and Christian, because when a person is in Christ, he is a new creation. Oh, my God. This is the same thing Jehovah's Witnesses say about people. You have a, quote-unquote, new personality, as they put it. Behold, old things have passed away, all things have become new. So you God, they even use the same verse, the new personality. That's a recipe to create a cult. When someone becomes a believer, they are born again to a new life. In other words, I identify with Christ. That's my identity. Okay. Identification. If your identification is in anything else, then it's not in Christ, and, and, and that's an epic fail on your part. You are deceived. Epic fail. See, he's picking up the kid's lingo here. And the bottom line is, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, if your identity is in your sexuality, you are seriously off base. Their identity isn't in their sexuality. That's the thing. They just are those things. Like, you are straight. People can just be something. They're, you know, these people made it their identity. These people are obsessed with people being gay or people not being gay. They can't deal with the fact that some people just are. Because God's got something so much deeper for us in Christ. If your sexuality is the deepest thing about you, you're missing nine-tenths of who God created you to be, because the identity he has for you goes way deeper than sexuality. Sexuality is powerful. Don't get Yeah, and you think that this is literally all people ever think about, like the fact that they're gay? Are you serious? People wouldn't think about it at all if he wasn't cramming it down their throat that they're gay and they can't be. Not just him, but like their parents on stage. You got me wrong. That's why so many people struggle with pornography. That's why so many people struggle with adultery. That's why so many people, why, why sexuality is just breaking people across around the world. It's powerful, but it's not even close to the power that is available to us in Christ. Our identity is intended to be way deeper than our sexuality. It's, a, it's intended to be in our very core of our being, and that is in our soul with Jesus Christ. This is such a joke. This is really sad, honestly. Amen. Amen. If, if, amen. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if I may add, though, when, when we come to Christ, we're instantly saved but then there's the sanctification process. Our brain and our body store all these memories, and so we need to bring all of it before the Lord. Okay, Lord, where did this begin? Why did I remember this at a young age? Show me where I've been deceived, and you will So I'm not sure, like, what, is she saying that people are deceived at a young age, and that is why they're gay? Walk through it, and that's why there's ministries to help walk alongside, and so what, uh, I have a, uh, I call it something. So I would sit with the Lord and asking this questions. Where did this come from? And that's when he revealed, you know, I, 24 years I did drugs and alcohol to push down the sexual abuse and how I detached from my mom because of the, just for various reasons. Um, but the, we'll lay him on us here, Mrs. Um, preacher. The Lord showed me all that. And a lot of it was really hard. So he would reveal the deception and then heal it with his truth. So I call it reveal and heal and over and over again wow that's creative reveal and heal reveal and heal and you know what the world calls that conversion therapy and they call that's what it is conversion therapy call it illegal wow they call it illegal it is illegal okay and it should be illegal yes so the very thing we need the government is calling it illegal 
But I want to I want to give you a word in a, a, a address in scripture that talks about conversion therapy. You ready? Acts three nineteen. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Again, I'm going to say this one more time. Okay, the Bible does not condemn gay marriage. It marriage didn't even exist at the time. So we all need to go through conversion therapy. Wow, I love it. That is awesome. No, it isn't. Jill, I saw the mic coming up to your mouth. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we also have to remember, and, and I say this a lot when I'm teaching in the group, that our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. It says that in Jeremiah. And a lot of the times we're going by our feelings. Well, I feel this way, so I must be this way. But when we point to the truth, to what God says... And it can be anything going on in our lives that we're deceived by. When we look to the truth, it washes away what we're thinking, that it's not truth. So I, I just like that because our hearts deceive us a lot of the time of the day. You, you have to agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. So we go to that truth, and I believe that helps people. Their eyes are open to like, okay, yeah, I'm feeling this way, but that doesn't make that truth in my life. And, and it goes back to what you said. Getting in touch with the root. There's a root to why we have those unmet needs in our lives and, and we, we get involved in homosexuality or we get involved in adultery, whatever sin it is. You know, whether it's homosexuality or adultery or lying, there is a root cause. And when we get to that root, God will bring healing to us, yeah. I believe. Amen. Amen. Okay. And have you noticed there aren't any adulterous Christians. Yeah, she looks just like my mom, or very, very similar to my mom, this woman does here. And you know what? She's actually got a similar personality. And lying Christians, I mean, those hyphenations don't exist, right? So there's something so powerful with the sexuality, like Jim, Pastor Jimmy was saying, that the enemy has taken it and he has twisted it. He has perverted it. And he is calling it an identity so that it makes it harder for us to address, to talk about, and to minister to, because then it's them that we are against. But it's I mean, it is. Yes, you are causing problems for the people in your lives. Absolutely. Not them. It's the sin. Amen. Amen. Well, we need to close here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's go ahead and, and, and pray and let's call it a night. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the things that, uh, that we've considered tonight. And, and Lord, I know that uh, there is a lot of hurt in this room. There are those that are struggling in this room. There's a lot of hurt in this room, really. These are the people hurting others. Are you shitting me? This is like them saying that they are willing to have a relationship with people. It's the people who don't want to have the relationship. It is such a joke. And there are those that are, are, are dealing with confusion and, and, uh, and, and they're at a loss as to what to do. And what I pray that this would be the beginning of a journey of victory. Father, that you would do a mighty work in, in, in their lives. And, and, and Father, that you would continue to, to give us wisdom to minister to those who struggle. And, and Father, that you would continue to use us for your glory. And, and Father, give us your heart that we might reach as many as possible for your name's sake and for your kingdom. Lord, we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dude, did, did Patty open her eyes before the end of the prayer and for your kingdom lord what you doing are you seeing this we love you and we pray these things in jesus name amen you're not supposed to do that amen all right god bless you guys and thank you so much for staying anyway yeah so that's the show that's a q a section if you want to see the beginning then keep watching because we're going to be doing that next Quick interjection, this won't take long, I promise. I'd appreciate it if you watched to the end of the video or at least a couple extra seconds because YouTube bases its algorithm off of watch time. The more watch time a video has, the further the video will go. Also, take a look at my website, owamorgan.com. I'm selling my book, Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses, 400 pages, and my second book, 100 Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses, which is about 80 pages. And you can find them both there on the website, audio form, ebook form, whatever. It's about my experiences within the religion and the 
the history of the religion generally. The 100 questions are intended to challenge your religious leaders, so I'd appreciate it if you give it a read.